Lemony. So what kind of like uh, or, um, mastering so gear do you have? This is a, a tube compressor. Okay. Um, kind of sounds like the Beatles, like old school 60s type. Really? Uh, yeah, it gets like a, like a real good Beatles guitar sound. This is a, um, just a distortion unit, basically. It's like a stereo tube distortion unit. When would you use that in mastering? I, I don't use that. I use that more for like beefing up like drum loops and stuff like that. Okay, so so, you, so when you're mastering, your I thought mastering you just take the whole track by itself. Yeah, you do, but uh, you can also use this or any of these other like EQs or as just effects just pedals, for, just for the tracks. Yeah, so okay. like while I'm writing, I'll run the tracks through them, and then in the end, use them for mastering, but like much more gently. Okay. So this is a stereo compressor, compressor. that works well on drums because it's like linked stereo, and then this is just a, a two channel EQ. This EQ. is another two channel EQ. Uh, do, do you think two channel EQs are better than say a five channel or seven channel? It just depends on what you need it for. They just like the ones that I was getting came in like pairs like that. So, so you pick, um, frequency, you can pick the one. frequency and then you cut pick the cut and boost. boost. Okay. Yeah. I everything I read always says that you should be cutting rather than boosting. Do you agree with that? Uh, generally, yeah, until you get really, really good, and then you can be more aggressive with it. But yeah. my, like, for me, it took so long to even know what I was doing. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's, just, that, I don't know what to do. That way. So, in EQing, like, I heard that you can get, like, a, an app where it shows you all the frequencies. Mm -hmm. And you want all the frequencies to be equal, right? Uh, no, each sound is going to have its own sonic signature of frequencies. Yeah. So, but like when you get like um, what I'm saying is like I have my my sister's uh, husband said like, imagine you had something playing and then it showed you all of the frequency. This is a song and like imagine it's like a graph and then you see like a dip and there's like oh at five thousand there's no music. Yeah, see that's that's what I when I first started trying to learn how to do this stuff. I spent a lot of time looking at where those peaks were yeah. and using subtract, thinking okay it's better to subtract, and I pushed them all down. Okay, <laughs> and it and it it. It didn't. It kind of made it clear, but it's not really what you want to do because what you end up doing is killing all the fundamentals and the overtones of the sound. Because that's yeah. what's ringing is the overtones and the fundamentals. So you're kind of so to an. But extent, what you're doing is you're allowing it to be louder in the end because yeah. you don't have peak because those peaks are going to go over that negative exactly. three. So, but certain things you do want to peak because you you know so it's, it takes uh, it's it's subtle. It takes a while, but but yeah, it's generally safer to cut. And yeah, you look for these like really egregious peaks. Because mm -hmm. certain sounds are going to have that, and you level those out. And, you know, like some of them are going to be masking other sounds, and so you want to get it out of the way so you can hear the other sound. Mm -hmm. um, but a certain amount of masking can kind of be good, so you can't, yeah. you can't go too far with it. But Yeah, and how do you feel about, like, transients? Uh, that's, well, yeah, well, compressors, like, it's, that's the cool thing about compressors is you can decide exactly how much transient you want. Okay. And, uh... Yeah, because I don't, I don't, like, I read about transients and they're like, like, it seems like those are like mistakes, but sometimes they're good mistakes. Yeah, it's like the, the transient is the attack of the sound. So with a compressor, think of it as basically an envelope where you can decide how much of the attack you want through. Yeah. So if you want no attack, or if you want to, like, if there's too much, like, in a voice, if there's too much, like, tch, 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 yeah. or in a drum, you know, you just put the attack on, on you know, like, on zero, like, on fast as possible, okay. and it will, it will um, smooth all that out. Or if you want to punch here, then you back the attack off, and it'll let more of the a transient through, and you get more punch. Okay, and so it, does a de-esser work by just affecting the attack? Yeah, yeah, a de-esser is an attack, but it's narrowed into like the that S frequency. Eight. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it's just like a hyper focused. What are these things over here? Um, this is these are microphone preamps. So like I run the uh, you know this is like basically a preamp to run you know, the drum machine into. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing, mic pre's, but they also have EQ channels on them. So each one of these has an EQ channel, but it's also just a mic pre. Okay. So I have four channels of mic pre there, two channels there. Why would you need uh, dedicated mic pre's like that? Like, like how my Mackie has mic pre's? Mm -hmm. Are mic pre's, like, really important? Uh, the Basically, it's one of those things where, like, the more you spend, or actually, that's not the more you spend, but after a certain point, like, once you spend a good amount of money on a fancy mic pre, it adds a nice amount of, like, very subtle harmonic distortion halo to it that makes it just sound like a record. Yeah, so yeah. So, it's, 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 I mean, it's distorting, yeah. ultimately, is what it's doing, but it's, it's so subtle, and it just makes it sound a little bit bigger, and, like, it's on film versus videotape, you know? Yeah. So. It sounds like radio versus for home recording. Yeah, exactly. So the mic pre's mic pre's do that. Um, if I I so I film local bands in San Francisco. Yeah. I've filmed seventy local bands. I have four hundred videos on YouTube. Wow. If you want to record bands and make money doing that when your wife leaves, 
and you, I, I imagine you could charge a reasonable price. They, I know a lot of people who would love this. That would be if, cool. if you want to be recording, or yeah. like to record I, music. I, I know how to do it. The only thing that I'm not experienced in is recording drums. Yeah. Um, that would be, well, I have to figure that out. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of phase issues. and But um, but I definitely, yeah, I, that would be cool. Yeah, because I, I, like, the French cassettes are, like, one of the bigger bands in the city, and I, I go to all of their shows and I film them. I am going to, I'm going to see Zodiac Death Valley tomorrow and Dirty Denim at Hemlock, and I'm bringing three cameras. Oh, cool. Because uh, I, uh, I told you, I, I, I got, went to a pawn shop, got a GoPro. The problem, they said it was broken, it just needed an SD card. Hmm. And I got another camera for, so I got both the GoPro and this other thing for $15. Whoa. And I just got stands, so... I'm gonna connect the GoPro to like one of the chicks. Like uh, it's an all-girl punk rock band, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna check the put the GoPro on the guitar just to have that view. Mm -hmm. Like um, I don't know. I just I've been taking the filming very seriously. That's cool. Um, and this this camera, believe it or not, um, has really good sound. But I always run the sound through Pro Tools, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've done some recording with people, but it's usually my students if I can talk them into. You know, like, if, if they're songwriters, and I'm like, you should have a good-sounding version of your song. What's so, the MC202 do? It's basically like a Roland, like an old Roland analog synth that has a built-in sequencer, kind of like a 303, well, not really a 303 sequencer, but sort of. It has a built-in sequencer, and it's a synth. Yeah. I was going to get a JP8080, mm -hmm. because that's like, does a lot of, like, trance stuff. Yeah, yeah. And my roommate was into trance. Yeah, one of my students has a, the keyboard version of the JP8000, and he brings, he's my one synth student, yeah. and he brings that once a week. I, uh, I wrote an email to Dave Smith Instruments uh -huh. today, and my email went, because I need a job, and I was like, and I make these YouTube videos that get 10,000 views, and I was like, you guys make the best synthesizers in the world, and yet you don't have the market share nearly as big as Korg and uh, Roland. But that shouldn't be the case. And the only reason is because of marketing. Yeah. So here's three videos where people are engaged and leaving comments. And I have, they're saying that they're buying the instrument because of my video. And I could do this and help you out. And I would love to do it because I think you guys are great. Um, but uh, their response um, it was that they would think about it. Mm. So I would love to do that. But they're like located in... A, that's a cool looking guitar. Yeah, it's a baritone. Huh. Um, they're located in North Beach. You know that? No. I mean, I knew they were somewhere around here, but yeah. no. Because I want to buy, I want to get rid of my mini log and buy a mofo. Because uh -huh. the mofo, have you ever heard of it? Yeah, yeah. And it has just like a really beefy low end. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, uh, 